Of course, it's not enough to be the first one with a telescope, be the first one with a new um, space mission that's looking in a new window, to actually realise that you're seeing something new. There is more to it than that. For example, I've talked about Galileo with his telescope. Here, if you compare Galileo's drawing of the surface of the moon with his telescope and a drawing done by Thomas Harriot, who in fact used the telescope earlier than Galileo for observations of the moon and other objects in the sky. You see that they, they both see the same things. The difference is that Galileo uses what he sees to speculate and to ask further questions and to make inferences. Observations aren't enough. You need to have the right kind of mind to interpret them. Serendipity plays a major role. You've got to have the luck of being the person to see that observation or to detect that particular galaxy as it's an outburst or to, to see something going on. But serendipity, that luck, is not everything. You need to have what's known as the prepared mind. Now, this comes from the quote from Pasteur, who is supposed to have said, chance favours the prepared mind. And this is the idea that you need to recognise a major discovery when you have one. You need to know what's normal, what's boring, to be able to recognise when you have got something that's new that is potentially going to change the whole paradigm of the subject. And there are many examples of fantastic serendipitous discoveries throughout astronomy. You can go right back to 1800, where Herschel discovers the infrared wave band, that the fact that there are other lights, other colours beyond the visible spectrum, again, just by chance, when he's doing an experiment to measure the temperatures of different colours. The discovery of X-rays 95 years later by Röntgen is, again, a serendipitous occurrence. These then have the implications that, you know, within the centuries, you then get new areas of astronomy that, and you see those new facets of cosmic objects. But it's not just these wave bands were serendipitously discovered in the first place. If you think of the very first exoplanets that were found, they were discovered in orbit around a pulsar, a dead star, one that's gone supernova and thrown off its outer layers. It's the last place anybody would ever have looked for a planetary system. But the presence of these planets was detected by variations in the pulse um, just showing how the gravity of the planets changes the spin of the pulsar. This is you know, a discovery that nobody had anticipated, but in 1992 was the first clear evidence of other planets out there where nobody would have, was coherently looking for them. And indeed, when you first find proper exoplanets, well, not proper, these are still proper, but find uh, exoplanets around a normal star, again, this is... It's not just enough to detect the signal. You have to do this shift in your thinking. You know that the breakthrough could have been made earlier. The difference is making that detection and changing your whole view of what it is you're looking for, realising that maybe you've got to change your view of what planets are out there. Again, this is an artist's impression of a hot Jupiter, but the idea that you could have other systems out there that don't resemble anything in our own solar system. You could have giant planets several times the size of Jupiter in close orbit around their host star. Things that people were not originally looking for, you have to recognise that serendipitous discovery and then work on the interpretation to realise what it is you've discovered. There are other examples. Again, the discovery of pulsars in the first place in 1967 relied on finding a radio signal that was substantially different from other radio signals out there. There's, uh, there are tales that actually the pulse signal in the radio had been detected before from military base installations in Alaska. The difference is actually the curiosity to follow up that pulse, to search down what could be the origin for it and then make the big discovery. And of course, the most revolutionary one of recent times, Permutter, Schmidt, Reese and their collaborators were looking for the point where the expansion of the universe started to slow down as a way of measuring the mass of the whole universe. You know, at what point does gravity kick in and start slowing down this expansion to bring everything back? And they didn't discover that. What they discovered was unanticipated, the fact this expansion is not slowing down, it is accelerating, it's getting faster. 
And from that observation, which is, again, serendipitous, they discover this three quarters of the universe, this dark energy that we were unaware was out there. So here again, serendipity plays a major role, but not just serendipity, it's a recognition, an ability to interpret what it is you've discovered.